It's no secret that Sega has been a name on the lips of gamers for several decades now. As of 2004, they exist under the umbrella of Sega Sammy Holdings. We all know the story of Sega, from their rise to prominence in the 16-bit era with Sonic the Hedgehog, to their exit from the console market. But what about Sammy? Where do they fit in? Who exactly are they? And what's their claim to fame? To better understand who we are and where we're going, we need to understand where we came from. These words ring true, be they in our world or one of fiction. My name's Zio, and I'll be your lore keeper. Sammy Corporation was founded in 1975 by current Sega Sammy chairman Hajime Satomi as Sammy Industry. The name stemmed from his nickname of Sammy at the time. Satomi attended Aoyama Gakuin University, a private Christian university in Tokyo's Shibuya district, but dropped out around the same time he started the company. Sammy was an entertainment division of Satomi Corporation, which was his family's food business. By 1977, the main company went belly up after 30 years, leaving Sammy as the only surviving entity. This was around the time that arcades were rising in popularity on both sides of the Pacific. Sammy began leveraging this by opening a factory in Tokyo's Itabashi Ward in 1978. It wasn't until the early 1980s that Sammy would enter the gambling industry in Japan, where they began marketing and selling pachinko machines. Hold it! Now, I know what you're thinking here. Wait, isn't gambling illegal in Japan? Well, for the most part, yes. Chapter 23 of Japan's Criminal Code deals with the subject. Article 185 states that, a person who gambles is punished by a fine of not more than 500,000 yen or a petty fine. Provided, however, that the same does not apply to a person who gambles occasionally, provided for recreational amusement. There are exceptions to this, such as horse racing and motorsports, but these operations are run by the government. Article 186 deals with habitual gamblers and the operation of gambling places for profit. This is where the pachinko parlors and a rather sneaky loophole come in. So, what exactly is pachinko? The initial concept dates back to 18th and 19th century France with a game called Bagatelle, which was the forerunner to modern pinball and pachinko. Of course, as things are brought to other parts of the world, they often take on a life of their own in that region. Unlike pinball, which only uses a single ball, pachinko utilizes several tiny metal balls. A pachinko machine has the user put their money into the machine where they're given a certain number of balls. The player hits buttons to land the balls in certain slots to get more balls. Here's where the loophole comes into play. At the end of the game, the balls are redeemed for prizes such as a coupon or a ticket. The tickets are then sold by the player off-site for cash. Interestingly enough, the parlors and the adjacent shops are sometimes owned by the same people. The pachinko industry has become notorious over the past several decades for tax evasion and ties with the Yakuza. Korean nationals have made up the majority of pachinko parlor owners and their employees since World War II in the face of discrimination by native Japanese. Many of these pachinko owners have funneled millions of dollars to North Korea over the years. This proved to be a lucrative venture for Sammy, who had no interest in the home video game console market at the time. But by the late 80s, they could no longer ignore the popularity of this emerging market. In 1988, they opened their North America branch, aptly named American Sammy, and began publishing home console games. They worked with smaller developers such as Acom and Micronix throughout those years. Acom made games for both the arcade and home consoles, most notably the NES. Eventually, they'd break off from Sammy and rebrand themselves before joining up with SNK in the late 90s. Micronix, on the other hand, became infamous for their janky arcade conversions like 1942 and Ghosts and Goblins and Ikari Warriors. Sammy started publishing games for the NES and eventually the Sega Genesis, but none of these games were exactly household names. You didn't know of too many kids who had one of their games back in the day, but you'd often see them for rent at your local video store. Sammy would keep working on video games and slot machines all throughout the 90s and eventually rebrand themselves to Sammy Corporation. Now you're probably thinking, that's good and all, but where does Sega fit into this? What was the impetus for such an unlikely union? Well, these two have more in common than you might realize. Both companies got their roots selling amusement machines before going into video games. Sega's nascent years were spent selling slot machines to US military bases in Japan. It wasn't uncommon for NCO and officers clubs to have at least one row of slot machines, if not an entire room filled with them. 
Those of us who are military brats living in Japan may recall having dinner with our families at one of these establishments and having our parents go off to play a round of slots after dinner. Meanwhile, us kids would go off and play arcade games if our parents gave us some quarters. Otherwise, we just sat on the couch in the lobby. Yes, one of those military brats was yours truly. So where exactly were these two companies at the turn of the century? Sammy was doing very well with their pachinko machines. They also produced the Atomus Wave arcade board in 2003, which was based off Sega's Naomi arcade system. Pachinko was their bread and butter, but this multi-million dollar industry has drawn constant criticism from the state over the years. Moreover, there were fears of stagnation as the higher-ups felt they were too reliant on that market sector and felt the need to diversify in the unlikely event that Pachinko was ever banned outright. Sega, on the other hand, was another story. While they created one of the most beloved characters in gaming history, they weren't doing so well financially. They were doing well in the arcades and enjoyed success in the 16-bit era thanks to Sonic the Hedgehog and their effective marketing strategies which led to a higher market share throughout the early 90s. But by the mid-90s, things started going sideways. The Saturn released in late 1994 in Japan and in the US and Europe the following year, but by this point Sony had emerged as a new challenger in the home console wars, giving both Sega and Nintendo a run for their money. There was also an internal civil war between Sega of Japan and their international branches resulting in missed opportunities with both Sony and Silicon Graphics. By the turn of the century they were practically hemorrhaging money. They were still doing well in the arcades, but this wasn't enough to offset the heavy losses incurred by declining console sales. In early 2001, Sega officially announced the discontinuation of the Dreamcast with their exit from the home console market. Instead, they'd focus on developing and publishing games on other consoles for Microsoft and longtime rival Nintendo. The idea for the pivot was championed by the higher-ups at Sega who felt the company shouldn't be handcuffed by their own hardware ecosystem. Then President Isao Okawa also shared the sentiment. Okawa died of heart failure shortly after the announcement. Okawa loaned half a billion dollars to Sega in 1999. Before his passing, Okawa forgave Sega's debts and returned his $695 million worth of Sega and CSK stock, which allowed them to survive the transition. Additionally, they had to lay off a third of their Tokyo workforce. Sega was also in talks with Microsoft's Xbox division about a possible sale or merger. Former Microsoft head Bill Gates balked at the idea because he felt that Sega wasn't strong enough to overtake Sony. In early 2003, Sega began talks with both Sammy and Namco. Sammy CEO Hajime Satomi was mentored by Okawa and was even asked to be Sega CEO. Although Satomi had tremendous respect for his friend and mentor, he would ultimately turn down the role to focus on his duties at Sammy. After all, this was his family business. In mid-2004, Sammy bought a controlling share of Sega for $1.1 billion, leading to the formation of Sega Sammy Holdings, with Hajime Satomi at the helm. Whenever two companies merge and assume both names, the larger company typically gets top billing, like Activision Blizzard, Bandai Namco, and Lockheed Martin. Usually the company with top billing wears the pants in the relationship. But if Sammy's the boss here, then why is Sega's name up front? Well, PR of course. Don't forget, Sammy's known for developing and marketing machines for an industry that monetizes the misery of others, so having Sega's name in front helps to soften that image. With this arrangement, they're ostensibly telling the world that they're a video game and entertainment company with a gambling business on the side. Sammy had the cash, and Sega had the technology and brand recognition in multiple industries. Under this new umbrella, Sega and Sammy continued to operate independently as subsidiaries of the new company. Sega would continue to produce both arcade and home console titles while Sammy continued its pachinko operations. Sammy would subsequently exit the video game industry and hand the rights to their previous titles off to Sega. Just like with Sega, there are actually several companies named Sammy under the Sega Sammy banner, each with their own leadership. You have the main Sammy company, which develops, produces, and markets their pachinko machines. Then you have Sammy Networks, established in 2000, responsible for application development for smartphones and PCs. You also have Sammy Digital Security, established in 2015, which handles the playtesting and debugging of both hardware and software. There's also Sammy Facility Services, which is essentially in charge of building, management, and maintenance. 
Sammy's pachinko endeavors continue to this day, and they're one of the largest pachinko producers in the world. However, they do face some existential threats, and not entirely what you might think. As of 2018, Japan passed a law permitting casinos into the country in the form of integrated resorts. The first of these integrated resorts, owned by MGM, is slated to open in 2029. But this comes with a caveat. In an effort to reduce gambling addiction, patrons can only enter the casino three times a week or ten times a month, and they'll have to pay a 6,000 yen entrance fee. Moreover, the popularity of Pachinko has waned over the years and not entirely due to recent world events. While the pandemic decimated the leisure and hospitality sectors worldwide, that's not the only driving force. Pachinko has always been seen as an older person's game, with the younger generation preferring to do their betting online. The decline in popularity has led to a surge in pachinko hall closures long before the pandemic even came into play. But it's not all gloom and doom here. The leisure and hospitality industries are on the rebound worldwide, which means more people are feeding their hard-earned money into the machines at their favorite pachinko spot, assuming it's still open. It's no secret that pachinko has become an institution in Japanese culture over the past eight decades and doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. Sammy has left their mark as a forerunner in this space for over 40 years, and they could very well do that for many more. If you enjoyed this, well, you know what to do. As always, thanks for watching. I hope you have a blessed day. And remember, to thine own self be true. Until next time, farewell.